seven years ago, on the Thursday night before spring break, my friends and I were out in the town celebrating the fact that we had just finished our last final exam. And on our way into the second venue, one of my friends stops almost mid-stride, pulls out his phone, and starts to tap away. Not 10 seconds later, he turns to me and says, I just tweeted that it smells like hair in here. Doesn't it smell like hair? <sighs> now, I know what most of you are thinking. Must have been a good time. You must have been raging drunk. And unfortunately for us, we were not in that state of mind just yet. Remember, it was just the second venue. We had a long way to go. But what that type of tweet symbolized is what we had come to expect from social media at that point in time, seven years ago, and also to some extent today. It created a stigma that social media is a place where there's so much noise, it's almost impossible to find any signal at all. Almost no meaning that we can pull from the tweets and posts and photos that we find online. But I actually argue that all of this, the status updates that have almost no substance, are actually part of something much bigger. Part of the way that we tell our stories. Now, in order to understand how we got here, we have to understand the way technology moves its way into our lives. And there are three stages for that to happen that every single technology goes through. Social media, the telephone, the telegraph, the television, the newspaper, the book, nothing is immune. And the first stage is dismissal. At that point in time, I looked at my friend in disbelief and said, really? What's the point? What kind of story can you tell in 140 characters? What kind of meaning can you get from that? If you go back in history, we've had similar arguments. Of the television in 1939, the New York Times said, the problem with the television is that someone has to sit and stare at a screen for a long period of time. The average American family has not time for it. Well, I, for one, am really glad we've solved the time issue. The second stage is adoption. Adoption is when it's pretty much par for the course. We all know what it is. We know how it works. We kind of see the benefit of it, and a lot of us are using it. Most of us here have Facebook profiles. A lot of you are on Twitter. And I promise not to tell anyone if you're on MySpace. But this is also where the pundits come out to play. The polarizing arguments on either side of the equation. One will say, this technology will bring about the end of the world as we know it. And another will say, we'll bring about peace because we'll better know our fellow man. In fact, the telephone was once called the end of provincialism. Another critic said that this would be responsible for the destruction of community because it encourages far-flung operations and far-flung relationships. Now, I think it's easy to see that neither one of these came to bear, but in a state like that, there's very little middle ground. Common sense doesn't always prevail. I think it's easy to see that we've all argued on either side of this equation. We've had those moments where it's really hard to focus or get anything done because we're so busy catching up on our status updates and the pings and the notices and the emails that we get that we don't have time to do what we're supposed to be doing. On the other side of that, we've all had these, a situation where we've connected with someone we haven't seen in five years, and maybe we got coffee with that person, and that would not have had happened if it weren't for that connection. So in order to avoid all the noise surrounding this argument, it's really important that we don't go beyond just observations, because it's easy for us to see the benefits of connection and the problems with overstimulation. Going to the third stage of technology is acceptance. And last year, Walt Mossberg of Recode made a really great comparison between the internet and the electrical grid. He said that when the internet fully integrates into our lives, we will no longer mention it. You didn't go to your significant other's day and say, would you like me to go on the grid and make you some toast? But you might have said, would you like me to go online and get you directions to that place you have to go. The way we reference technology shows a lot about our relationship to it. And it's obvious that we haven't gotten there yet, 
with social media. In fact, we are squarely planted in the middle of the adoption phase. We've all argued on both sides. We understand the benefits, but there's so much noise we don't know where we're headed. And eventually we'll get there. But we have a lot of work to do in the meantime. And a lot of it is because of the way we're trying to navigate our way in that story. And digital and social have profoundly changed the way that we do tell our own stories. In fact, there are two particular types of stories that digital has impacted more than anything else. And that is the stories we tell about ourselves and the stories that we tell with each other. We are no longer a society that just consumes information, that receives it from a broadcast media, one too many. We are now all publishers. We have all become digital storytellers where we are broadcasting from many to many. We have become digital authors and we now have social media as our campfire. Now I have a confession to make. When I was writing this talk, I was tempted to call it how I stopped learn, worrying and learned to love the selfie. <laughs> but I decided not to for two reasons. One is a few of you got the reference to Dr. Strangelove. Most probably won't. And two, I hate selfies. Or at least I did. If we take a look at the selfie, which is probably the most maligned activity in social media, there's actually a lot to unpack. It's easy to give in to our inner cynic and say, that person's taking a selfie, they're shallow. Especially when they're doing it all the time. But the selfie does a few things. For some, it's a photographic diary that I was here in this place, and this is my mark in my story, in my time, right now. That I was here that I can come back and show it to myself and remind me of that story later, or remind others of that story. But to go even further and to examine those who do almost nothing but take selfies, the Instagram profile of the high school student who might have 30 in a day, selfie after selfie after selfie after selfie, that's a harder one to crack. But there's something big going on here. It's not about just self-validation. It's not just about, oh, look how hot I am today. It is actually born from other habits. And it's about understanding how we are perceived by others and how we navigate our world. The interesting thing about social media is it enabled us to receive instant feedback. We no longer have to wait to ask someone how they see us. The second we posted something online, we are receiving that feedback immediately, whether it's a like or a heart or an actual conversation. And those bits of feedback help us figure out how we posture ourselves. And whether that's posture or veneer, there's a part of that that's authentic because it is how we see ourselves and how we want others to see ourselves. To make a comparison, for those of us who were in high school 10, 20, and 30 years ago, we didn't have this, that's quite obvious, but there were two moments in our high school career every year that defined who we wanted people to see us as and gave us feedback on how they saw that. And those two moments are the yearbook photo and back to school. The yearbook photo, a lot of us spent a lot of time trying to figure out what are we gonna wear? How are we going to look? How are we going to pose? Are we going to get the laser photograph background or not? But that was crafting an image. As far as back to school goes, there was a lot of agonizing about what kind of stories am I going to tell when I get back there? Who am I going to be with this year? What kind of image do I want? Do I want to be a jock? I really want to be different. I don't just want to be the, the drama guy. I want to be a jock. I'm going to be so different this year. And on that day, when we get back, all of a sudden we see, based on our interactions with other people, how people perceive us. Does our story match with their perception of me? How do I need to adjust? What does this mean for me going forward? So there is a comparison, and we've gone from a society where there is no such thing as a second chance for a first impression, to every day is back to school. Now, people may argue that that image we uh, put online is false or inauthentic. 
I don't think so. I think that there is a bit of truth in every single thing we post online, no matter how hard we try to hide it. Social media is an identity engine. No matter what we do, what we think, what we believe, what we do, what we say, will make its way online in some way, and any unit in isolation can be extracted and analyzed from which way to Sunday. But when you take a look at the bigger picture, what this all means together, a story does emerge. A story of who that person is, who they were two years ago, the conversations they're having today, the posts that they're putting online, shows you a transformation of their thoughts, their feelings, their philosophy. There was actually a study done recently where participants were described by both their best friends and by strangers. And the only thing the strangers could see was their Facebook profile. And what was shocking was that the descriptions were very accurate. In fact, at times, almost in lockstep with each other. So it shows how much we can glean from someone else without having even met them, because we are actively telling our stories online. We're always telling them, whether just about ourselves or with each other. And that second type of story is the one that we collectively create, the stories that we tell with each other. As I said before, we are no longer a society that just accepts information, we now create it. We create stories together, we insert ourselves in the news. If you take a look at the Arab Spring, there's no way that would have happened without the digital and the physical enmeshing completely. If you try to separate one from the other, it collapses. There's no way you can tell that story without the two of them working together. There's no way that story would have inserted itself into the popular conscious without those two. And this is happening every day. From the way that we receive our news, to understanding this, the world around us, to actually helping people get aid in other countries. We are now creating those stories together in ways that we never could have before. So the critics will say that technology has made us more disconnected than ever, that we don't really appreciate life offline, that we're so busy documenting our lives that we don't know how to live it. But I believe we've actually adapted to telling our stories with more people than we've ever done before. And with that, we are more connected than we've ever been before. So the next time you see someone pull out their phone and snap a picture of themselves, think about what's the Lord larger story that this is telling. And one more thing. Will you smile with me? Thank you.